Awesome, it's going. Okay, uh, morning, gentlemen. Uh, I'm Austin. I'm filling in for Dr. Dave today, as you guys all know. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about my story um, with addiction and my journey from addiction into freedom. Um, and then beyond that, I'm going to talk about the six key puzzle pieces, the kicks, six key things that I feel really came into place for me um, that uh, I feel really cemented my freedom into, into place. And it, it became a place of walking victory instead of um, kind of struggle, struggling in like a miry muck. Um, I was born into a, to a small town and to a large family. Uh, I was number two of seven and really, really wonderful family. I've got amazing parents who are pastors. I've got great siblings who are all uh, wonderful and all in their own journeys, you know, serving the Lord. And um, I grew up in this an amazing family, but I was exposed uh, to pornography very young um, in, in, you know, the world's eyes. It was, you know, probably that normal age is that 11 year old exposure. But um, I think for, for myself, that was very young to be exposed to, um, to pornography. Um, I was in our, in our childhood home and we had had this art room upstairs or this school room upstairs and we had all these books and uh, I had been drawn up to this. I felt very drawn up to this bookshelf and I pulled out one of the books on the shelf and it was a drawing book. And on the back of the book was thumb, thumbnails of all the other books that this art company would release. Um, and one of the thumbnails was scribbled out, but the title was still beneath it. And the title said, how to draw nudes. And my 11 year old mind went, what on earth is a nude? And so I opened up Google, which was brand new at that time. And I uh, Googled this word and I can still, like I still have the picture scarred on the back of my skull of what I saw. And um, that was how I was exposed to pornography. And um, nobody knew, I didn't really know. I knew it was wrong, but I didn't know why. And I knew, definitely don't tell my parents about it. Um, and so at that point, I'd started looking at, at these images that I had found and I ended up showing a friend. And then a few years later, about a year and a half later, I ended up showing uh, my, one of my little sisters. And she had said, I don't, I don't really think this is good. I think I should tell mom and dad. And I said, no, you definitely shouldn't tell mom and dad. I, here, here's all my change. And so I tried to bribe her with about $5 in loose change. Um, and that didn't work. Um, and so she had told my parents and, and there was originally just a, kind of a big freak out. And it was like this big, um, dramatic, uh, heartbreaking thing for, for my parents to have their, 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 you know, 12 year old son addicted to pornography or looking at pornography. Um, and so there was very quick reactions, um, but not, not much as far as lasting reaction beyond just a software that was, that was put on the computer. And so, um, apart from some conversations and I think my dad and I, we read a book together, it just kind of fizzled out. And that was, it was pretty much, I was back into being alone in this addiction and, and finding ways around the software, finding ways to access, um, um, adult content without any supervision or without anybody knowing. And, I went through kind of the cycle of finding ways around it and finding just different access points as a, um, as a young kid and then into my teenage years. Um, <clears throat> and I remember very specifically at one point going to relapse, having this intent to relapse. And I remember thinking, I know this is wrong, but I can just say sorry later. I can just repent later. And that scared the crap out of me. That freaked me out because I knew that I was abusing grace. And I can't remember if I, I know that I, I stopped on that, that train and I stopped going down that path, but I think it was either later that day or later the next day or the following day that I, I relapsed again. Um, and then I had another moment when I was 16 where um, I really, felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, Austin, if you do this, you're going to lose everything. You will lose everything. 
And that freaked me out. And I think that freaked me out for a good three or four days before I relapsed again. Um, and I was thinking about this last year. And when I went through, when Chantal and I went through our big separation, we did lose everything. I did lose everything in that word that, um, that I feel like I heard did come true. I, I feel so fortunate that the Lord brought back so much that I had lost and that he resurrected so much that I had lost, but that word did come true. Um, from my teenage years into kind of adulthood, I kept, uh, kept looking at pornography and I kind of found this, this cycle of maybe three weeks to 40 days to a few months of, of binge and then, and then abstain and binge and abstain. Um, but I never really had anybody walking with me and different youth different youth groups or different church conferences i would go up to the altar and i would try and hand over this um this burden in my life this big addiction but i never had anybody walking with me i never had any community to um to come out of the addiction to engage in the opposite of the addiction and so i i would always have these moments of 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 like grave sorrow and, and just like a very repentant heart with no follow through and no ability to follow through. Um, fast forward to when I ended up meeting um, Chantel, who's was then my girlfriend and then my wife on our first date, I actually um, had kind of just, just the way conversation when I opened up that I was something I struggled with. Um, and then there was no conversation beyond that about it. Um, and through dating, I um, struggled a few times with it. And then when we were engaged, uh, I think it happened about twice. I relapsed about twice. And then into marriage, for the first six months, there was nothing. There was no desire. There was no um, looking. There was no lusting after anything. And I thought I was in the clear. I thought like, man, I am free. This is amazing. Uh, no, I was wrong. I was so wrong. Um, I ended up opening up Instagram on my phone almost six months to the day after getting married and um, following the chain of photos that led to a relapse. And um, I, I realized at that moment that I was a husband who was going to be looking at pornography or who was looking at pornography behind his, his wife's back. And that like really, really felt really grave. And so I, I wrote this, this big grand letter of apology and I told my wife right away, I told her right away and I wrote this big letter of apology. And I thought I was doing the mature thing. I thought I was being the mature um, version of myself. I actually found the letter in a box um, earlier this year and I reread it and I understand what I was trying to say, but I could like the immaturity just bleeds through the lines of what I was saying. And it was a very immature disclosure and it was a very immature way of trying to, to make amends and trying to come clean and trying to um, be God honoring and, and honoring to my wife as well. Um, and then three months go by and my wife's on a trip and it happens again. But this time it's a deep dive. It's not just looking at stuff on Instagram. It's a deep binge. And I didn't have the courage to tell her. And then um, that was in March or May of 2018. And up until then, my addiction had mostly been digital. It was something that I had kept on the computer. I would kept on my phone and I hadn't really taken it into, um, into the real world or into public. Um, and I would maybe notice people in public, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, look with, with very lustful eyes, or I wouldn't be searching out to see what I could see. Um, and then in July of that year, I'd gone, um, cliff jumping with some friends and there were some ladies that came and started sunbathing without any clothes on. And I 
looked for a long time. And it wasn't like I stole a glance every few minutes. I, I just, for about two hours, I just watched. And something really, I really let something firmly take a hold of me. And up until then, I had been working at this, at this uh, mechanic shop. And across the street from us was this apartment where there was three different um, apartments that if you were patient enough during the week, you could see something. Um, and up until that point, I had no interest. And if the guys would start hooting and hollering, I would just go into the back of the shop and work on, work on something else until whatever it was that was happening had passed. And then after this moment, what well, we were cliff jumping, or I, moments probably too short a word to use, after this period of time, all of a sudden it was what I was focusing on. All of a sudden it was the thing I wanted to see. I didn't want to really see it on my phone anymore. That wasn't enough. I wanted to see it in person. And so at work, I began to watch like a hawk and whenever anybody would walk by the shop, I would be watching to, to glean whatever little micro piece of lust I could, I could get my hands on in this, in this real person way. Um, and still through that, I'm trying to step back from the addiction. Still from that, I'm trying to get out, but I'm alone. And I start talking to um, my dad over the phone and I start connecting with a pastor at my church. But still at this point, I haven't disclosed to my wife that I've been, I've been looking at pornography and that I've been you know, looking at other women lustfully in public. And um, we get to February of 2019 and I can't handle the guilt anymore. And so I cave and I just, and she hasn't been asking me. So it's not like I've been, I've been actively lying. And she's asked me, have you been looking at this? And I say, no, a lie. I just wouldn't tell her. And so it's just this big secret and I wouldn't tell her. And so finally I told her in February of 2019 and I go through a uh, almost full disclosure, making the mistake not to do a full disclosure. Um, or I wouldn't say making a mistake, actively making a choice not to fully disclose everything. And um, we start this journey of trying to walk through my addiction together and walk through healing together. And um, we start reading books and we start watching different um, different Christian series on freedom and we um, sign up for freedom sessions at our at our church and um, all the while my addiction is just growing in this hunger to see things in public um, and I'm managing to to maybe abstain from from pornography every two three weeks to 40 days and so I'm telling her every time and it's just over and over and over. I'm crushing her. Um, and then a big pivotal moment in our, in our walk was in July of 2019. Um, we had had some guests staying in our Airbnb and I had noticed that they hadn't closed the curtains and then laying awake at night, I had all, I had heard that one of them got into the shower. And so I got up and I walked to a different place in our house and I watched uh, the guest come out of the shower and, and change and my wife had thought that I had got up and had gone and you know, looked at looked at something and relapsed in the in the digital aspect and so she left in that morning just snuck out of the house and left for the day and when we finally met in the evening we we met to go have dinner and talk about how to move forward and how to stop repeating this cycle. Um, and we were downtown in Vancouver and I, as we were walking, basically told her that what had happened was that I had gone and looked at somebody not even 30 feet away from her in person in our house. And it, it didn't like, it didn't break her the way it broke her every other time I told her it absolutely crushed her it obliterated her. And um, that part of you that, that feels like you're locked in the trunk, that part of you, while the other part of you is committing the addiction, that part of you that hates it, the part of you that feels guilty and feels, 
feels ashamed and is in that immaturity, that part of me was crushed at the way I was breaking my wife's heart, but also crushed by me because I couldn't, I couldn't get free crushed by the way I was hurting her and I was hurting myself. And I'd leaned up against the wall and I, you know, kind of fallen down to be sitting against this wall. And I look up to see a fist flying at my face. Um, and my wife punched me really hard in the face. Um, but she missed my nose and she broke her, her knuckle on her finger. And so not only had I, I hurt her so, so many ways emotionally, and in her, in her trust and in her self-image and in her, her idea of her own beauty. But I had also now been the cause for her physically in pain and physically not um, physically injured. Um, and that was where a big shift happened where she really started to pull away from me for good reason. She really started to distance herself from me for good reason. And every time I would tell her, I looked at it, I looked at it again, or I failed again. Um, it would, it would crush her and she would, she would have a smaller reaction and just a quieter response. Um, and then in November of 2019, I finally decided it was, it was enough. I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna tell her anymore because it was just too painful. It was just too too hard, too much work. Um, and so I decided to switch my accountability. And so I found somebody else to talk to, but I didn't tell her that I was switching my accountability. And so I started lying. And um, for three months, I lied. Then November, December, and January, I lied. And she would ask me, like, how have you been doing? How's it been going? And I, I would just give a vague yeah, well, it's tough. It's a struggle, blah, blah, blah. I wouldn't fully answer. And I, I took it to the place where now I was, I was lying, bare face lies straight to her face. Um, and I couldn't handle that. I couldn't handle the guilt that was associated with that. And by February, I told her, you know, I've, I've been lying to you. I've been lying to you. And I, I've, I've been looking and I've been telling somebody else and I, I, I haven't been honest. And at that point she wanted to separate. She said, I'm done. I don't want to be here. I want to separate. And so I, um, I started pulling out scripture after scripture, after scripture, trying to cling to this marriage, trying to cling to this relationship, trying to maintain control. And um, I managed to convince her for a few months that we shouldn't separate. And I managed to convince her that, that uh, things were gonna change. And then I relapsed again in June, June 8th, 2020, that was my last relapse. And I told her and she said, that's it, we're done, that's it. And by the 24th, um, we had had this meeting with, with, our, with our pastors that I thought was going to be a, another meeting of how to, how to figure it out and how to make it work and everything. And it was, I got blindsided by this meeting. I went, went into this meeting and basically was sat down by my pastor and he was like, you're separated. You're not going home. This is it. This is what it is. This is, this is law. In fact, now you were separated. Your marriage is in separation. And that crushed me, that broke, um, broke me. And, and I was so self-focused that I, that I didn't have the capacity to see the way I was hurting her. I didn't have the capacity to see the way I was crushing her. And I lived through this whole addiction focused on my pain and focused on the pain I would experience from causing her pain focus not on her pain, but on the pain I would experience from her pain, focus on, on the difficulty I would experience from her difficulty, not on her difficulty. And so in this place of, of complete selfishness, I was just broken and I was just so immature and 
ended up living in my car for two months before moving back to the Okanagan and working through healing and meeting Dr. Dave and encountering freedom. Um, and thankfully, I haven't relapsed since June 8th. Thankfully, that has been the last day that I turned to look at pornography. Um, but throughout that journey, there were six, six key things that I really felt like were major puzzle pieces for me that clicked into place that, that really um, cemented freedom in my life, that really brought about freedom. And I don't think I am experiencing freedom one without the other. Um, the first one was that I really had this epiphany on June 8th. It was, it was right after I relapsed. I had this epiphany that, and, and I want to be careful how I say this, but pornography was 5% of my problem. 5% of my, my acting out was with porn. 5% of my time in the addiction was with porn. 95% of my time was lusting, was fantasizing, was looking for what I could see in public. And I had this grand idea that if I could deal with the 5% and I could get rid of the porn, the 95% would, would go away. The big pile of stuff would leave. And what I had this, uh, this realization was that really my problem was the lust and that this porn was a very large symptom of, of my lust. And so at, the, at this point, I, I realized, okay, I need to be dealing with the lust. I need to be dealing with the stolen looks in the grocery store and with the, with the rubbernecking as, as somebody's walking down the street. Um, and so I started to make this decision, I made this decision that I wasn't going to let lust be in my life. I wasn't going to let myself lust as I was walking down the street or in the grocery store or at the beach. And that if I dealt with this, this larger area, the problem that I wanted to go, the pornography would actually be easier for me to, to um, fight for, it would be easier for me to abstain from if I was dealing with this larger larger area, which is a lot more work, but it's also, it's also easier to just turn your head away and just let the moment pass than it is to fight this built up tension that you've been building up over days, looking and looking and looking lustfully that when it comes time to, to have that temptation for pornography, um, it's, there's so much lust backed up that it just breaks like a dam. And so this epiphany that I really needed to deal with the 95% of lust and the pornography would, would, would start to work um, or, or my, my addiction with pornography would start to be an easier battle really rang true. And as I focused on this, this 95%, I focused on not looking lustfully. And as I focused on keeping my eyes straight when I was driving, it got a lot easier, a lot easier to fight the temptation to look at porn and to fight the temptation to, to, um, to have um, wandering eyes online or to, to go where I shouldn't be going on the internet. Um, so that was a big key for me was, was realizing that it's actually where my mind is 95% of the time as opposed to the 5%. The next thing that I really um, feel like was a big key for me was that I had been avoiding pain my whole life. I had been avoiding um, dealing with my pain my whole life. And I got to this point where, where God forced my hand and brought pain into my life that I had to experience, that I had no choice but to experience. I'd gone through a lot of bullying as a, as a child and I had attempted suicide at one point and I'd gone through a bunch of pain growing up that I just kind of put into a room and just put it in long-term storage and I just wasn't going to deal with it. Um, but my lifelong hero and my, my, like my grandfather, who I got the privilege of working alongside with for four or five years and somebody I really admired, who's a very strong man in the faith, ended up having a stroke 
and I had to process the pain of, of potentially losing him. I had to start processing this pain. And after, after a year of him having the stroke, he ended up passing away. And at that point I couldn't like thinking about it. I couldn't not do him that justice. I couldn't ignore that because I honored him so much and I respected him so much. And so I decided I was going to process this pain. But what I learned about pain is it's not selective. If you're going to process it, you process it all. If you're not going to process it, you can't process it, any of it. And so I had this pain that I started to process. And as I'm working through this, this um, pain from losing my grandfather, all of this pain from my childhood starts to surface up. All of this pain from the bullying that I experienced starts to surface up. All of the pain that I experienced from my relationships with my siblings and, and the pain from how I was actually hurting my wife and the pain that, that I was causing her and causing myself. And so I began to process this pain and I began to process it and it was being dealt with and it was being handed over to God. And instead of having it stored up as this motivator to medicate, it was being dealt with in a, in a correct way. And I really believe that experiencing the pain and not just storing it was a very large portion for me to walk into freedom. Um, the next uh, next big key that I felt was, was really integral for me to experience freedom um, was a, a really awesome mistake that I made. It, I had been in prayer and I said, God, I want you to refine me. And I had this mental picture that popped into my head immediately. And I saw this giant hand reach into a kiln and pull out this little miniature me and set me on an anvil. And then this hand with a hammer came down and started smashing this little, this little miniature me and the Looney Tunes running with the cloud, but you're not moving anywhere because I'm trying to avoid the pain that I've just asked for. Um, and, and so I prayed this prayer, God, I want you to refine me. And at that point, all of the puzzle pieces for our separation started moving into place. Everything started moving into place. And about four months later, we separated. And it was at that place where I started to really experience pain and have to experience it and be refined. And in that refining where the heat's turned up and it gets really, really painful and it gets really, really hot, a lot of those impurities, those things inside us that we don't like, they rise to the surface. And we, we have the, the refiner uses a, a ladle and he scoops that dross off to the surface. And so in that, in that request to be refined, which, yeah, you could say it was a mistake or foolish, but I, I don't mean, I mean that lightheartedly. I, I don't regret at praying that. And I think it's a great prayer to pray, but you got to be ready for the consequences of praying that prayer and you got to be ready to actually handle the temperature of the refining process um and so through that i really i really feel that as i began to cry out for refining as i began to cry out for god i want freedom and i want to grow and i want to be a mature man of god and i don't want to be immature for the rest of my life in that i really feel like the lord answered that prayer and he really answered um my desire to be refined um but man it hurt oh man it hurt and it will and it's a good pain it's a good pain that, that needs to hurt because the pain of being refined is so worth the the actual fact of being refined because it's what's inside of you that comes out when when you're weak it's what's inside of you that comes out when when you're struggling and tired and alone and if what's inside of you is removed and is replaced with holiness, then holiness comes out and, and, and a righteous character comes out when it's tough. Um, the next thing I feel that really um, was a main key for me when, I, when it came to finding freedom was I kind of had my eyes open to the trick of lust. I kind of had my eyes open to the bait and switch. And before it was, it was like, I would, I would feel the urge and I would, I would feel the reason to lust. And I would see that whatever I was lusting for, if I had that, then, then it would be complete. I would be whole by having whatever I was lusting for. And 
I had, had my eyes open to this bait and switch where you have this, this beautiful whatever that you're lusting after. And the moment you go to reach it, it turns rotten and it turns into something that causes pain and it turns into something that, that, that hurts you and it hurts your spouse. And it, it's kind of like when, when you watch, I don't know, Penn and Teller and you watch them um, talk about where the sleight of hand happens in the trick. And then when you watch the trick the next time, you see where the, the coin is moved from this hand to this hand or where the sleight of hand it's the sleight of hand happens. I had my eyes open to where the sleight of hand was happening in this lust trick, where if I if I followed and I focused on on the lust, the switch would happen and I would be left in pain without what without the the completion I was looking for, without the the healing or the um the medication that I was looking for without the, the resolution to what I was needing. Um, and as I had my, my hand open or my eyes open to that, I, I kind of began to scoff at the temptation. I kind of began to scoff at the lust because it just, it didn't have its allure anymore. It didn't have its, its draw anymore. It, it was just like, it was like a sad excuse for a, for a convincing argument that I should go it's like, I, I literally remember sitting there and I heard this little whisper, you should go look at porn. I was like, that's it. That's all you got. That's your, that's your big convincing argument. I was like, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. Like go to hell. Um, and as my eyes were open to that bait and switch, I really, a lot of the desire was gone. A lot of the, the, the allure to, to the addiction left. Um, and then the last thing that I really, I really feel like was a big key for me. Um, and if anybody's ever talked to me about freedom, you've heard me talk about this. It's, it's memorizing scripture, specifically memorizing the chapter of Romans six. Um, it is, oh, it is a game changer. It is like a nuclear weapon for defeating and untangling that, that addiction brain pathway. Um, I was reading a book and I was reading this book and this pastor basically talked about how he defeated lust with, with memorizing this chapter of Romans six. And I said, well, if it worked for him, it's going to have to work for me. And so I memorized this chapter and I started pulling out scripture, whatever my thought went to a previous picture that I had seen, or whenever my thought went to, to, uh, somebody who was walking down the street or somebody in this, in the grocery store that I had seen or, or, uh, urge to to think or fantasize about something i would start quoting either mentally or verbally romans 6 and the first verse says what should we say then should we go on sinning so that grace may increase by no means we are those who have died to sin how can we live in it any longer and the rest of the chapter the 23 verses basically untangle the argument for sin and present the argument for baptism and how we've actually died to it and how we're no longer under the law of sin. We're no longer under that command. And the, the, the word that they use, I think in it's either verse 12 or 13 is consider yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. And that word is actually a Greek accounting word that basically it's the same way when, when you look at the bank account and the bank account says your balance is $24 or your balance is $18,000 this is what your balance is, that consider it is, is an accounting term that basically says in your bank account, there is no death. You are dead to sin and you are alive to Christ. And when you begin to live with that, that faith that you can take your card and you can go and tap your card for whatever you're going to tap for, because the, the account says you have this amount and you live with that and say, no, the account says I am dead to sin and alive to Christ. And you, and you act on that and you, you, you make that payment or you make that purchase mentally, it sticks. And this, this piece of scripture and, and it's maybe, yeah, like, oh, you memorized a chapter of scripture. That's so hard. It's actually, it's pretty easy. It took a few weeks of a little bit of discipline, a few minutes here or there, and it changed my life. And I still quote it probably 20 times a day. And I don't quote the whole thing. I just quote the first four to seven verses, or sometimes just the first verse where my, my brain goes to a little thought or, or 
my brain goes out of line and I just you know, quote the verse. What should we say then? Should we go on sinning so that grace may increase? And what I even found is, is when I would switch the word sin for the behavior I wanted to remove. I had a lot of manipulation that I didn't know was in my life. I had a lot of manipulation and control that I didn't wasn't aware of um, because I was so blinded by the addiction. And so I got to the point where when I was messaging back and forth with Chantel through the separation, I would go, what should we say then? Should we go on being manipulative and controlling so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to manipulation and control because I really wanted to uproot that from my life. And I wanted to remove that from my life. And when I began to hone in on the problem with scripture, it really changed. Um, and so that, that's something I'll, I'll take it to the grave. That is probably one of the biggest pieces for me that has, has got me out of the, out of the mindset that leads to relapse. The mindset that leads to sin is this, is this shift with scripture that it's just like, it's, it's a flinch. When you flinch, it's just an instinctual reaction. I learned to flinch. I learned to immediately react with scripture. And I think that's, I think that's part of what scripture is for. Um, so yeah, that is the, the sixth reason. And that I believe those, those six things are really integral for, um, for uh, the, the way I, I found freedom and encountered freedom. Um, and as a bit of a testimony to that, I'm now 604 days all clear. And I am 652 days since I last looked at pornography or masturbated. And I genuinely believe that I'm walking in freedom. And I genuinely believe it's because of those six, um, those six things that are, are really integral to freedom. And above and beyond that, if I were to add a seventh, I, I would honestly say it would be regroup. It would be this connection with these guys, with you guys and with Dr. Dave. Um, I've never encountered relationship with other guys like this anywhere else. I've never encountered brutal honesty and, and care with any other group of people than I have found here at Regroup. Um, I want to thank you guys.